Now all particles obey a certain set of conservation laws, and these laws can be very useful in determining which particles you may get out of a reaction. And the common exam question that you can get is kind of deducing what kind of particles are, are coming in or what particles are going out. And like, or maybe you're given a reaction and you're asked to see whether this reaction obeys all of the conservation laws. So they're pretty useful. Now, remember, anything that is said to be conserved, it basically means, is it the same before and after a reaction? So it is conserved if it is the same before the reaction as it is after the reaction. So let's start by looking at the conservation of charge. And charge is a quantity that is conserved in all particle reactions. And so what's it saying? It says that the total charge before the reaction is the same as the total charge after reaction. So let's take the example of beta minus decay. So let's draw out the, or let's just write down the equation for oh, beta minus decay. So we have the neutron turning into a proton plus an electron, or okay, electron neutrino, just for some reason I wrote that one first, plus the electron there. So anti-electron neutrino plus the electron. So let's have a look and see if charge is conserved. Well, what's the charge on this side of the reaction? On this side, we've only got the neutron. And of course, the neutron is neutral. So on this side, we simply have zero. And what is the total charge on this side of the reaction? Well, here we've got the proton, which is a charge of plus one. The anti-electron neutrino, which is, of course, well, it's a neutrino, so it's got no charge at all. And the electron, which, of course, is negatively charged. So we have plus one, plus zero, minus one. What does that add to? Zero. So we can see that the charge before the reaction and after the reaction is the same. And so, therefore, charge is conserved. The next thing that is conserved is baryon number. And again, baryon number is, of course, simply the number of baryons present. So a proton would have a baryon number of plus one, a neutron would have a baryon number of plus one, a pion would have a baryon number of zero, an electron would have a baryon number of zero. You get the idea. It's basically just the number of baryons and Maybe I should say that the antiproton has a baryon number of minus one. So let's use the example of beta minus decay again. So let's just write it out. So a neutron turns into a proton plus an electron. I'll write it in the normal way around this time. Plus the electron antineutrino. So let's have a look at baryon number before and after. Well, what have we got on the left-hand side? We've got the neutron, again, just a neutron. And, well, the neutron is a type of baryon, and so it has a baryon number of plus one. So what about the right-hand side? Well, on the right-hand side, we've got the proton, which is, of course, a baryon. But we've also got the electron, which isn't a baryon, so it has a baryon number of zero, plus the electron antineutrino, which again is a lepton, it's not a baryon, so it's going to have a baryon number of zero. So what are these total? Well, before we got one on this hand side and one on this hand side. So again, baryon number is conserved. Now next we have the quantity of lepton number. And unfortunately, this one is a bit more complicated. You see, with baryon number, we just simply compare the number of baryons on this side with the number of baryons on this side. However, instead of doing the same thing with leptons, we actually conserve lepton numbers for each branch of leptons. And so, remember I said before, the types of lep leptons were the electron, the muon, and the tau. 
and each of these electrons had their own neutrinos. So you had the electron neutrino, the mu neutrino, and the tau neutrino. And all of these, of course, have their own antiparticles. So these guys all have, they're all leptons, but they all have different respective lepton numbers. So these two guys right here, they have an electron lepton number of plus one, whereas all these guys right here, they're not, they got nothing to do with electrons, so they all have an electron lepton number of zero. However, that's only electron lepton number. If we look at mu lepton number, then these guys, they're not, nothing to do with mu's, and neither are these guys right here. These guys are going to have a mu lepton number of plus one. But the mu lepton number is a different quantity to the electron lepton number. And so it's a different thing that has to be conserved. So let's take the reaction in which a positive muon decays into an positron plus an anti mu neutrino and an electron neutrino. So let's count the respective lepton number before and after. And let's start with electron lepton number. So what's the electron lepton number of this side of the reaction? Well, this is a, this is a positively charged muon, an anti-muon, got nothing to do with electrons, so it's gonna be zero. What about this hand side? Well, we've got the positron. Now the positron is an antiparticle, remember, and so it's gonna have a electron lepton number of minus one. So you see all these guys, these are all normal particles and therefore their corresponding antiparticles are gonna just have the sign reversed. So the positron has a electron lepton number of minus one and this anti-mu neutrino, that's not nothing to do with electrons, so it's zero. And we've got the electron neutrino. Now that's a normal particle, it's not an antiparticle, so that's gonna have a electron lepton number of one. So do these two sides equal? Well, yes they do. Zero equals minus one plus zero plus one. These two, these two just add to give zero. And, and so electron lepton number before and after this reaction is zero. But that's only with electron lepton number. What about the mu lepton number? Is that conserved? Well, if we have a look at the mu lepton number, this, the mu lepton number of this guy right here, well, it's an antiparticle. So it has a mu lepton number of minus one. And what about on this hand side here? Well, this has got nothing to do with mu. It's an electron. It's not a mu particle. And so it's got zero. And what about this guy right here? Well, it's an anti-mu neutrino. It's an antiparticle. So it has a mu lepton number of minus one. And this hands up, this guy right here, it's not nothing to do with muse, so just simply zero. And so hopefully you can see on both sides, the mu lepton number is minus one, so the mu lepton number is conserved before and after the reaction. And the final thing that is conserved is strangeness. So just to recap, we found that kaons are the particles which have strangeness. None of these other ones have strangeness. It's just the kaons because they're the only ones that contain strange quarks. And remember I said that the, the normal strange quark actually has a strangeness of minus one. And the anti-strange quark has a strangeness of plus one. Now, strangeness is only conserved in reactions which involve the strong force. Now, it might be worth making a note of that. It's only conserved in strong force interactions. If it's a weak interaction, then the strangeness doesn't necessarily have to be conserved. It could be, but 
it's not conserved in all interactions. So it's only interactions involving the strong force in which strangeness is conserved. So let's do one final example uh, showing the conservation of strangeness. So we have a pi minus meson plus a proton goes into a kaon plus this new particle which is called the lambda and you may be asking what's this lambda particle well you don't have to know it don't worry um, but its quark composition is up down strange so it's not one that you have to know but you may be given on given a question in which you are given an unknown particle uh, but you have to use what you know about conservation laws and the quarks you do know about to maybe deduce or, you know, deduce something about particles that you don't know about. So you don't actually have to know that this particle exists. I'm just using it for this example. So let's see if strangeness is conserved in this reaction. Well, we have, what is the strangeness on this side? It is, well, the pion's not strange. It's a perfectly normal particle. And the proton isn't strange either. So there's no strangeness on this side. What about this side? Well, the normal k on the k zero, not the k bar zero, but we're just dealing with a normal k on right here, was it had the quark composition of up anti strange. But of course, anti-strange has a strangeness of plus one. And the normal strange quark has a strangeness of minus one. So this guy right here has a strangeness of minus one. The K zero has a strangeness of plus one. Add these two together, we just get zero. So we can see that strangeness is conserved in this reaction. So now we have a pretty good introduction to particle physics and the standard model. However, everything I've told you so far is only as much as physicists know as of today. There are certain things such as gravity in which this model doesn't explain at all. We still don't know whether the graviton particle that I mentioned a couple of videos ago actually exists. Uh, and we're hoping that with facilities such as the Large Hadron Collider, that we'll be able to make more discoveries and find out whether these missing particles exist or not and therefore further our understanding of particle physics and indeed the universe. So this video concludes section two, looking at particles, interactions, and all that stuff. And in the next video, we will start uh, with the section on quantum phenomena. And we're gonna take a look at the photoelectric effect. So stay tuned.